Now, the pandemic has led to the closure of schools globally. At the peak of the lockdown, almost 1.6 billion children were out of the classroom. Some research suggests that time away from school will have a lifelong impact to future earnings. Let's get insights from Singapore's Minister for Education, Chan Chun Singh. Minister, good to have you with us. Thank you, Haslinda. Good to see you again. And you. Now, Singapore was one of the last countries to close its schools, one of the first to reopen, much to the relief of parents, I'm sure, especially when compared to uh, places like Hong Kong. How did you manage to, to do that? What was the thinking? Uh, well, Haslinda, we have ne never actually closed our school in a sense if uh, closing schools means the stopping of uh, our education system of learning. Actually, what we have done was that we transited into what we call blended learning with a combination of physical school with uh, what we call home-based learning using technology. And I think that's what many other countries have done as well. So with that, we have been able to minimize the disruption to the learning of our students. But having said that, you know, the learning of the students is not just about uh, picking up the academic grades and the skills. Uh, that, I think, it can be done quite easily with the home-based learning over the internet. But I think we all share the longer-term concerns on the social-emotional development of our children and also whether they have the opportunity to link up with their friends overseas. The transition wasn't that easy, right, Minister? I mean, there were some challenges. How did you overcome them? Well, we were a bit fortunate because uh, in the transition, we have started this even prior to COVID. Because prior to COVID, we had this vision that, you know, learning has to go beyond the classroom. So prior to COVID, we were beginning to make preparations for us to have what we call blended learning, which is to move some of the classes to online, because we believe this is one of the core skill sets that our students must have, the ability to learn on, at their own pace, using their own time, and then combine that with physical classroom. Because if we think about it, going forward, more and more of the physical classroom time will be used on collaborations and uh, the new forms of uh, creati uh, encouraging creativity. Whereas it's not just, learning is not just about the transmission of knowledge and the receiving of knowledge. If that is the only thing about learning, then today I think the internet can perform many, much of those functions. So we have a different vision of uh, learning in uh, going forward, where it's really about people coming together to collaborate and create something new. Uh, as the saying goes, you know, we are not just trying to teach our students how to solve yesterday's problem with yesterday's solutions. We are trying to get them to solve tomorrow's problem with tomorrow's solution. And that requires collaboration. I'll pick up on the vision slightly later, but when schools were reopened in Singapore, how did you manage uh, to do that without the classrooms becoming I guess, a super spreader location? Well, there are two parts that we need to do well. One is what we call the health uh, protocols, which means that we need strict health protocols in the school to prevent what you call it becoming a cluster uh, or a super spreader uh, venue. And that requires us to have uh, safe management measures, uh, good personal hygiene, good social habits, the wearing of masks, the regular temperature checking, and also to go in and do the test necessary if we suspect there's a cluster of cases. So that part is what we call the management of the health protocol, and that part is a bit more straightforward. But equally important, I think for many countries, we realize that we are not just managing a health issue. We are also managing a public confidence issue. Uh, you can open the schools, but if the parents and the children are not confident of your protocols, they do not think that you are transparent with the information, they might lack the confidence for them to return back to school physically. And that is the other part that we need to do well, which is to be entirely transparent with our protocols, with the information that we have, so that we can uh, inspire confidence in our public, our parents and our children to go back to school safely. Uh, two years on, some normalcy has returned. If you were to look back on the last two years, on hindsight, is there anything you would have done differently? Well, I would say we would never want to waste a crisis and there are many things that we want to do faster and better. Uh, first example would be the blended learning model. We would like to shift more of our classes online for our students to pick up the skill set to be able to do self-paced learning. So, because this is something that they will need to do in, in time to come. So going forward, we expect more and more time in school to be spent on collaboration and uh, creativity and uh, encouraging creativity. So when less and less time on just the transmission of knowledge. So 
taking the lessons from COVID, we will move more and more of our lessons online, allowing our students to do self-paced learning, encouraging them to pick up the skills to learn, on, uh, learn by themselves. I think the second lesson that we can all learn from this is that technology is a great enabler to lighten the workload of our teachers. Because with good technology, you can now scale the good pedagogies, the good lessons to the classrooms across the, uh, the nation as fast as you can. So that's something that we really want to do more and uh, do faster compared to the, the past. Now, beyond the, that, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, the thing is, Singapore is in a privileged position. Students have internet access, but globally, there is a digital divide. Two in three children and young people below 25 lack an internet connection at home. And, and that, of course, is worsening the inequalities in terms of access to education. Why do you think other countries have found themselves so unprepared for remote learning? Well, you are right. Singapore, in some sense, is a bit privileged in that we are a small nation, so it's perhaps a bit easier for us to proliferate the devices. And we do have our fair share of uh, students and families who may not have uh, access to broadband, but we do our best to... Uh, provide them with the devices and also the bandwidth necessary outside the school environment for them to access the information and the curriculum. Now, but having said that, that is just an enabler. What really matters are really good teachers that can help guide the students, even if we have the broadband and the devices. Uh, during the pandemic, when we have to go on to home-based learning, we recognize that not every family, every child would be able to have a conducive environment at home to do the learning. And in fact, even during those times, in the most difficult of times, we kept our schools open for students who have higher needs to return back to schools to be guided by the teachers physically. So I think notwithstanding the fact that Singapore is slightly more privileged than many other countries in the, our ability to proliferate the devices, I think what really makes the difference is really the quality of the teachers, the commitment of our teachers to help each and every last student to assess the curriculum during the pandemic. When we take a look at the uneven internet access, how do you think this might play out? Because it is estimated that about, what, 38 million children worldwide are entirely without access to schooling. How, how might this play out for the world? What would it mean for the most vulnerable in Asia, in Southeast Asia? Indeed, I mean, people have talked about a potential di digital divide. But on the other hand, actually, it could be a great digital leveler as well. We have seen many countries much larger than Singapore able to scale up the proliferation of uh, access to good quality education through the internet services. So I think this is also a tremendous opportunity if we can just focus our resources on equipping our people with the devices, getting the curriculum right, and by that I don't mean just trans, uh, transposing the physical classroom into the digital classroom, as, as if we just to digitize the what we call the analog version, but really to change the pedagogy and get the students engaged. I think there's tremendous opportunity. I will just use an example. This morning, I just visited a class. And, um, you know, during my time, uh, the sum knowledge of everything was called the Encyclopedia Britannica. If you have a set of Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, <laughs> you, you kind of made it. <laughs> and if you have access to a, a set of Encyclopedia Britannica, you have made it. And, most of us don't have Encyclopedia Britannica. Maybe there's only one or two sets in the library. But today, our students have the world at their fingertips. And the question is, how do we guide them to make use of this deluge of information, this plethora of information? For them, it's a new skill set that's required, which is how to sense make in a world where you have an overload of information, how to differentiate between what is uh, right and what's wrong, what is uh, verifiable and what is unverified. Uh, so I think those are new skill sets that we need to help our students pick up in this new world. So given the new skill sets which are required, there needs to be a rethinking of education. It's become such a fast-changing uh, world. Adaptability, continued retraining, resilience are key. How do we rethink formal education to meet the skills needed for the future? What will the future of learning look like? Well, I think the most important skill set that we can equip our students to learn for life is to ignite their innate curiosity and to have the passion to keep learning. And the skill set to learn, unlearn, and relearn is the most important. Because we have come to this conclusion, in a fast-changing world like what we have today, there's no way, absolutely no way for us to front-load the education 
system to, for our students and expect that to last for life. You know, we always have this saying that today we, I mean, in the past, we spent maybe 15 to 20 years front loading the education system. And then we put all the investments up in front in the first 15 to 20 years to prepare them for the first job. But then we forget to ask ourselves how much time and how much resources do we spend on our, our people as they grow to become adults for the next five to 10 jobs. And nobody, or not nobody, a very few people will actually do, just do one job throughout their whole life now. And people change job every few years. And our challenge is how do we re-equip our people every few years? Which is why uh, in Singapore, we say that we must go from MOE, the Ministry of Education, just for schools to the Ministry of Education for life. Our job of educating and training our people doesn't stop with the first 15 to 20 years. We need new programs, new pedagogies, new andragogies to equip our adult learners so that they can learn throughout life. And the other change I think that we need to make is this. There's this saying that the adults must go back to school. I, I think it's not the right concept because it's very difficult for adults to go back to school because adults have their own financial responsibilities, family commitments, and so many other things demanding their time and attention. But instead, for the adult andragogy, we need to bring the school to the adults so that, such that anyone can learn anything, anywhere, at their own time. So that will be a fundamental change. Minister, in my conversation with DBS CEO Piyush Gupta, he said that uh, the best way to instill uh, the right way of thinking among students to meet the needs of the future is to equip them with social sciences subjects. Uh, how, how do you respond to that? Well, in Singapore, we are increasingly emphasizing what we call interdisciplinarity. We want our people to be, have the basic STEM foundation, STEM meaning the science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics foundation. But you also need uh, to develop the other part of it, the aesthetic, the social sciences, and so forth. So that in future, when we are solving tomorrow's problem with tomorrow's solution, the tomorrow's solution can, be, can come from elements from both the science and the arts background. And you need this kind of, this ability to blend different perspectives together to create those new solutions to solve some of the very challenging uh, problems that we have in the world today. So you cannot just depend on the knowledge from one particular field. But where people specialize, whether it's in the science or in the arts, they can make their choices depending on their interests and their preferences. But having said that, we want to equip everyone with a, a bit of exposure to both. Uh, so if you, if you like, it's a bit of a T-shaped model. People specialize in different things, but everyone must have a bit of a breath in the, in the span of things that they learn. If skills become obsolete so fast, is there a need to emphasize, for instance, tertiary education? I can take courses that would be relevant to what I want to pursue. In a meritocratic system like Singapore, how would you view such an approach? Well, I would say a couple of things. Uh, first, whether you get a degree or a diploma is just a means to an end. And it's definitely not the end of learning. In fact, we have this term, we say that it's more important to have what we call continuous meritocracy. A single exam, a single degree and single diploma will not define the outcome for your entire life. In fact, just as the jobs change every few years, it also opens up opportunities for our people every few years. Then the survival of the fittest depends on who can evolve the fastest. It doesn't depend so much as just your starting point or your resources, but it depends on the speed of evolution. Then the question is, how do we help our people to evolve faster by equipping and re-equipping them with the skills in a just-in-time manner? And that is a challenge going forward for all education systems across the world. Then is it fair to expect that Singapore would have to rethink, I guess, academic success, how academic success is defined? Uh, yes, I've been speaking about this uh, quite often <laughs> recently. What do we, how do we define success for our children? And I have a couple of thoughts to share with my uh, teachers whenever I meet them. First, success doesn't mean that you have achieved some macro score at the population level. Success means bringing out the best in every individual, right? And the success means that they can keep surpassing themselves rather than surpassing some other people in an exam. It's more important for us to surpass and keep surpassing ourselves throughout life than to surpass someone else in a particular exam or test. So that's the first point. The second thing about 
success is that if it can ignite the innate curiosity for people to learn, to be self-motivated learner, then I think we have set them on the correct path in life. So there's no point trying to force feed them or to front load the education system for them if they do not appreciate the joy of learning. The third thing is that success comes from ability to appreciate diversity of perspective. It means that we allow our people to connect with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, so that they can work as a team, to collaborate as a team, beyond just the absorption of knowledge or the transmission of knowledge by the institutions. But all these require us to change the way we approach uh, teaching and approach learning. A lot to mull over. Minister, we thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your insights. Thank you, Haslinda.